Uh, this was a picture taken from a recent edition of Science magazine, and it, it's a simulation of what New York looked like in the 16th century. And we forget that most of the planet uh, is the land surface. We've so changed. Uh, we've taken away what was once a great big forested planet, nearly everywhere apart from the deserts. And uh, all of this stuff is what was doing the regulating. That doesn't do any regulating at all. Uh, and it's rather easy to take all this for granted and think that the world we live in is a natural environment. It isn't. It's something we've changed completely. The um, present IPCC models, even though they underestimate, predict almost unanimously that by 2040, the average summer in the north temperate regions of the world will be as hot as the summer was in 2003 in Europe. Now, I don't know whether you remember, but in that year, over 30,000 people died of heat. The land of Europe, if it had a repeat of that continuously, year after year, would revert to scrub and desert. But so would the rest of the world at those kind of latitudes. It would affect North America, China, India, Africa, and so on. Uh, and you would then have a world by 2030, 2040, where there was very little food grown. And this, I think, is what will cause the greatest loss of life. And under those circumstances, I can well imagine that people in North America will be migrating here to here in Canada, and the Chinese will be moving either to Siberia or Africa. But will there be enough food for them all? When we were hunter-gatherers, and only a few million of us occupied the earth. We were in balance with nature, and the CO2 we breathed out was absorbed by the plants in its entirety. Now the air the seven billion of us breathe out adds 2,000 million tons of CO2 to the air every year. That's four times as much as um, is, is emitted by all of the airlines of the world. In other words, if you want to improve your carbon footprint, the best thing to do is to hold your breath. Um, I think Paul and Anne Ehrlich were right to say in 1980 that, that it was preposterous to imagine as possible a population of six billion people living a first world lifestyle. And we're coming to discover their prediction was true. We may have as much as 20 years to prepare for the changes, and we can't go on burning fossil fuel, but our cities do need abundant electricity to survive. Apart from hydroelectricity, and perhaps solar thermal energy, as will be possible by steam raising from reflectors in places like Arizona, um, there the really isn't very much option for us if we're going to stop adding CO2, but using nuclear energy. And I, I think we just have to drop the kind of uh, green objections to that form of energy. They, they really are rather foolish because there is nothing safer. The evidence indicates that it, of all forms of power production, it probably causes less loss of, loss of life than any other. So we, we will have to use it. But it's not for everywhere. Uh, places like Iceland, where they have plenty of geothermal energy. There's no point in there using nuclear energy. And the same applies to Norway, where there's abundant renewable energy as hydro. And, uh, but for small, crowded countries like the U United Kingdom, there's almost no um, alternative. Uh, I'm glad to see that in Ontario here, as in France, you have your, or you're getting here towards about the right mix. France is almost perfect. You still are burning some fossil fuel, but still moving towards uh, an, an energy economy based on hydro, electricity, and nuclear. And that, I think, is about near ideal for the present changing conditions, and will keep cities running. 55 million years ago, a similar amount of carbon dioxide was added to the air by a geological accident. The temperature rose between 5 and 8 Celsius, 
but there was no great extinction of species, and this may have been because life had time to migrate to the cooler regions of the Arctic and Antarctic and remain there until the planet cooled off again. It took a long time. It took 200,000 years to cool. Now, this may happen again, and humans, animals, and plants are already moving to Canada, Alaska, and the oceanic parts of northern Europe and Siberia. And maybe there they may be spared the worst of the heat and drought that climate, that global heating brings. So this puts a very special responsibility on us to stay civilized and give refuge to an unimaginably large number of climate refugees. Perhaps the saddest thing is that if we fail altogether and humans go extinct, Gaia will lose as much or more than we do. For not only will wildlife and whole ecosystems also vanish along with us, but in human civilization, the planet has a precious resource. We're not just a disease on the planet. We have, through our intelligence and communication, become the planetary equivalent of a nervous system. Look at it. We've let, let the Earth see itself from outside and see what an incredibly beautiful planet it is. And we talk about it as we're doing today. So we shouldn't feel guilty. In the Earth's history, there have been other organisms that in their early development wreaked havoc that was far worse than anything that we are doing. And yet now, they're vital components of Gaia. The photosynthesizers that first released oxygen must have been far worse polluters than we are, for when they first released it, oxygen was as deadly as chlorine would be released now. Yet over the years, life has adapted to them, made use of them, and now, now there are the trees that give off the gas that empowers animal life and even lets us drive our cars. It's taken Gaia at least three and a half billion years to involve an intelligent, partly social animal species. The photosynthesizers had a long time to wait before they became trees, and so we have to be patient while we slowly evolve to become an integral part of what could be an intelligent planet. But what a future for us and for Gaia that would be. Thank you. Thank you.